All right, we are continuing to talk about waves. So we're going to start talking about sound now. We're going to look at how sound works and how it's formed. We're going to continue talking about harmonics with sound. We'll do a little bit of calculation with it. Hopefully that makes a little bit more sense um, after seeing what we've already done with harmonics. Then we're going to talk about beat frequency, which is something um, most of you mu musicians are already familiar with. And then we're going to talk about the Doppler shift. So let's jump in. Um, sound is a compression wave, as we've already discussed in class. So when we have a source of sound, what it does is send compressions of air. And so we have, as the crest of our wave is a compression, and, and, and then here we have a decompression, or what we call a rare fraction. Rare diffraction. So a compression and a rare fraction. And as these things move through the air, they're shaking the individual air molecules like in that in that video we saw earlier now when it gets to your ear those compressions and those rare fractions shake these tamponic membranes and these little bitty tiny bones in the inside of your ear and you got nerves that are designed to hear them um, so instead of looking at a normal waveform like this this is the wave that we're used to seeing where you have a crest And a trough, the sound wave has just compressions and rare fractions. So instead of calling this a crest, we're going to call it a compression. And we're going to call the trough a rare fraction. Now, sound's a pretty cool thing. Um, it has the ability to resonate. If you've ever been at a parade or a concert standing in front of the speaker, you can feel your body move when sound waves hit it. Most everything's going to vibrate when sound waves hit it. But when a sound wave hits something at just the right frequency, it's, it's going to be able to transfer that sound from one object to another. Uh, um, let's say I have a tuning fork here. My terrible drawing of a tuning fork. And let's say it's a tuning fork that is set to 440 hertz. That means the tuning fork is going to vibrate 440 times a second. So let's say we get it going. It starts vibrating and we bring in another tuning fork. And we'll look at this in class. And this tuning fork is also a 440 hertz tuning fork. Now, as the sound waves go from one tuning fork to another, it's going to start to make it ring. It's going to transfer the sound between two objects. That's resonance, sound transferring from one object to another. We saw that in class with our, our strings resonating at certain frequencies. Well, sound can do that too. Um, in fact, that's how a lot of instruments are designed. So if we look here at open tube resonance, what we're going to see is different different waveforms fitting inside of, of an open tube. Now, at the open end, and we draw a regular wave just because it's easier to see, at the open end we're going to have crests at both open ends. That means I can only fit certain waveforms in there. So the smallest one I can fit is this one. It's half a wavelength. If we were to look at if we were to look at the rest of the wavelength and go if it starts up here the rest of the wave would go all the way over here. That'd be a full wavelength. So this is only half a wavelength in this tube. So it's going to be the same air for all three tubes. The next one that's going to have two antinodes at the end here, um, two antinodes for my waves, uh, is going to be one full wavelength. So this one is lambda over two. This one is 
2 lambda over 2, and this one is 3 lambda, one and a half wavelengths. This should remind us um, of the harmonics that we saw on the string. It's going up in the same way, but instead of having two nodes at the ends, this time I'm going to have two anti-nodes at the end, but I'm still increasing by half a wavelength every time. In, in this case, we also see if this is our fundamental frequency, since we've since we've um, half the wavelength, this wavelength is lambda over here is equal to 2L, and lambda here is equal to L. Since I half the wavelength from here to here, I'm going to double the frequency. That's going to be frequency 2. And then over here, this is 2 thirds L is equal to lambda. And so what I've done is taken my original wavelength, and I've divided it by 3 which means that I'm going to take my original frequency and multiply it by 3. So that's how we get harmonics in an open tube. And there are certain instruments that are open tubes. I'm not quite sure about that. Maybe flute. I'm not sure. So um, we can also have resonance in a tube that's closed at one end. A tube that's closed in one end, if you want to think about it, is like a Coke bottle. You blow across the top and you get it to go. Um, this is a little different. Here, the closed end can only have a node. And of course, the open end, just like uh, a tube open at both ends, is going to have an antinode. Those are our possibilities for that. Now, looking at this, um, I can fit, that's just a quarter of a wavelength. So lambda over 4 is equal to my length. So for this one, lambda is equal to that length divided by 4. Nope, did that wrong. Lambda here is going to be that length times 4. Now if we look at this next waveform, I'm not going to be able to fit this waveform inside of this tube. It's not going to happen because based on the size of the wave, okay, I can't put an antinode right there. So I'm not going to be able to do that, but I can with this next one. With this next one, I can do, a, it will resonate in a tube closed at one end. So if this is my fundamental, I got my fundamental wavelength being 4L. Let's see what happens down here with the next possible thing. Well, if this is a quarter of a wave, this is half a wave and another quarter. This is that length being equal to three-fourths of a complete wavelength. If that's the case, then lambda over here is equal to four times that length divided by 3. Well, here I've divided my, my wavelength by 3, so I'm going to increase this new frequency here is going to be 3 times my fundamental frequency. That's going to be the third harmonic. So if we look at this, this is my first harmonic. We skip the second because it wasn't possible, and we jump straight to the third harmonic. There, there are this works a little bit differently. And again, looking here at what would be the fourth harmonic, I see that I can't fit that inside of my closed tube because there's a node at the end. So we get rid of that completely. And then we're over here. Well, this one, if we put a closed tube there, we're going to have that length is equal to, well, let's look at it, one quarter, two quarters, three quarters, four quarters, Five, five lambda over four, meaning that now this lambda is equal to four L over five. And so this frequency, which is going to be the fifth harmonic, is going to be five times my fundamental frequency. This is a lot different from what we were looking at before. 
uh, because it's only open at one end, because we're dealing with not half waves, but quarter waves this time. In, in this case, the harmonics that we see are the odd harmonics, one, three, and five. This is the harmonics, this is the resonance that we're going to talk about with sound. And, and we'll have an opportunity to play around with, especially the tube close at one end in class. So, another thing that we can talk about with sound is, is the beat frequency. Beat frequency is a very interesting thing. And again, you, you, you band students out there, you band students out there are going to be familiar with what's happening. With beat frequency, we're going to have two very, very similar waves. This kind of green wave and the other wave, which is a little bit purple. Now, as these waves move in air, you can see, you can see them getting more similar and more similar as time goes on. Right here, they're right on top of each other, which means we have constructive interference. And as they begin to move farther and farther apart, we're going to see a crest start to move on top of um, a trough. And in that case, we're going to have negative interference. We're going to have destructive interference, and it's going to be a quiet spot. So what we see with this thing is an increase an increase in the amplitude of the wave that we hear, the big blue line when they line up, and as they begin to become a little bit off and not line up anymore, we see a decrease in the amplitude of the wave that we hear. And it's a minimum, and so we have a loud sound and a soft sound, and a loud sound and a soft sound. So we're going to hear that right now. Um, we're going to hear that beep frequency. So um, if you're on headphones, you might want to turn it down. So. We're going to hear that beat frequency right now. It's that wah 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 sound as it keeps going. Now, beat frequency is sort of the easiest thing in the world to calculate. And if you're in the band, I'm sure you've heard these beats before. That's how you tune instruments to make sure they're playing the exact same frequency. You tune it until the beats go away. Now, beat frequency here is the absolute value of the difference between the two frequencies that you're hearing. Beat frequency is the difference between the first frequency and the second frequency. Um, it would be the green line and the purple line in this example. So that's beat frequency. It's really, really easy, and it's something that a lot of you I know hear every day. Moving on to the Doppler shift, this one is really, in my opinion, the coolest thing ever. Um, in the Doppler shift, we hear a change in the frequency of sound uh, based on velocity. So we're about to see a train head towards us. Uh, blowing its whistle, and we're gonna we're gonna hear a high frequency, and then as it passes, it's going to abruptly change. That right there was the Doppler shift. We heard the frequency go from a high pitch to a low pitch, uh, and so we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so with the Doppler shift, we have our original frequency. Let's say we're standing right here at the origin. Let's say that line represents the original frequency. And we hear this with cars honking their horns, fire engines, police cars, things like that. As the source is approaching you, we hear a high-pitched sound, much higher, maybe not much higher, but a little bit higher than the original frequency. As it passes you, it abruptly changes, and we hear a low-pitched frequency. It used to make you guys calculate this. We're not going to do that anymore, but, but anytime a source is moving towards us or we're running towards a source, we hear it shifted up, and then as it's moving away from us, we hear it shifted down. Now, the nice thing about this is that the shift... Um, is constant with constant velocity.
If a car is driving towards me at 30 miles an hour, I'm going to hear the same frequency the entire time. Okay, it's going to be the same high frequency. It may get louder, but it's not going to increase in frequency. It's going to keep the same frequency the entire time. And then as that car passes me, it's going to drop down. As it drives away at that constant velocity, again, it's going to have the same frequency. It's not going to change as it gets farther away. Um, police cars use this with their radar. Um, this is how we know that different stars are moving the Doppler shift. So that's